joy and a privilege for us to be here this day is God has called us to come this day to worship him. And that is what we're about this day. Um, you'll notice in your bulletin that the theme, it comes from Psalm 37. And let me read to you where you can follow along as I read it. It says, better is the little of the righteous than the abundance of many wicked. And we'll see why in a second, but just to let you know, to set it up, the little of the righteous is real. The abundance of the wicked is cotton candy, right? So it looks a lot. It looks huge. But you put a huge piece of cotton candy in your mouth and all you have left is, is, is nothing. Um, and that is why what they've got is not of anything of substance. Um, so the little of the righteous um, is better than the abundance of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked will be broken, but the Lord sustains the righteous. Brothers and sisters, ultimately, that's what we've got. In the world's eyes, that's a little. But in our eyes, that's everything. The Lord sustains us. We've got a God, a real God, who cares, and the world doesn't. And uh, that is the being that we've come to this uh, out of worship, a God who sustains us and upholds us in the fire. I would invite you to bow together with me in preparation to enter into, into the presence of this great king and this great sustainer of, our, um, of his people. And uh, prepare your hearts to worship. Worship, in, biblically, is an act where God condescends to us. We do not ascend unto God. God condescends to us. And therefore, our prayer today is not that God would lift us up, but that God would meet with us where we are. He would enable us as uh, individuals and a uh, congregation to worship him in a manner that's pleasing to him. So I invite you to bow together with me and let's pray for that and more as we prepare to enter into the presence of God this day. Let's pray. Father, what a joy it is to be called by your name and to given, be given a hope and a future and, Lord, to know that the little, in the world's eyes, the little that we have in eternity is, is abundance. Thank you, God, that we come here this day with the knowledge that you are the sustainer, the lifter of our head. And we pray now, God, that you would enable us to worship you aright. Condescend and meet with us and enable us, O oh God, to worship you this day with... Um, uh, sincere hearts with um, intentionality and therefore integrity. And therefore, Lord, may our yes be yes and our no no and our praise be praise and our confessions be confessions. Minimize our distractions, we pray. And in the words of the psalmist, unite our hearts to worship your name this day. This we pray in Jesus' name. Please pray for them. Praise the Lord, all nations. Laud him, all peoples. For his loving kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord is everlasting. Praise the Lord. Brothers and sisters, we are called this day from Psalm 117 to come and praise the Lord. Let us do just that using hymn 76. Praise my soul, hymn 76. And let's stand. Praise my soul, the King of heaven, to his feet your tribute bring. Ransom, healed, restored, forgiven, who like me his praise should sing. Praise him, praise him, praise him, praise him, praise the everlasting. Hey! 
praise him, praise him, praise him, praise him, glorious in his faithfulness. Father, like he tends and spares us, well our feeble frame he knows. In his hands he gently bears us, rescues us from all our foes. Praise him, praise him, praise him, praise him, widely as his mercy goes. Frail as summer's flowery flourish, blows the wind and it is gone. But while mortals rise and perish, God endures unchanging on. Praise him, praise him, praise him, praise him, praise the high eternal. Angels help us to adore him. You behold him face to face. Sun and moon bow down before him, dwellers all in time and space. Praise him, praise him, praise him, praise him, praise with us the God of grace. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we bow before you this day praising your holy name, praising that you are the great I am, the God who reigns supreme and reigns over all of this world and in this world, such that, Lord, if, an, if, if a calamity comes to a city, Isaiah says, it is you who have ordained it. Lord, the very hairs of our head are numbered. The king's heart is like channels of water in the hands of, of you. And so, Lord, we bow before you this day in the presence of, this, of you, our great God, and are humbled at your greatness. But we say we love you, God, and we adore you. And pray, O oh Lord, that you would be exalted today. We give to you this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be seated. And as you are being seated, please locate your bulletin and let us together confess our sins. We are worshiping God corporately, not individually, but corporately. Monday through Saturday is individual. Sunday is corporate. And therefore, it's appropriate for us to, to pray corporately. And we just did that with Hymn 76 set to music. We're going to do that now again, but without music. Um, and the question is, will this be a prayer of your heart that is determined not by the form of the prayer, but, but what's in your, in your heart, whether or not you mean the, these words. And so please don't just read them, but pray these words together and uh, let's confess our sins. And then afterwards, we will spend time silently confessing because certainly this could not reflect what needs to be prayed perhaps on your part as we worship God in confession. So let's confess corporately uh, together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have declared that today we should return to you with a whole heart. Yet we know that we have not returned. We are unable to return. You have declared that genuine repentance would cause us to lose our appetite for other things, for food, for the lusts of this world. Yet our appetites remain and we continue to delight in the passing pleasures of sin rather than you. You have declared that a true nature would include weeping and mourning, brokenness and contriteness of heart. We are unable to conjure up such emotions, such brokenness, such contriteness. We have not wept. We have not mourned. We have come to the end of ourselves Heavenly Father, as such we lay ourselves before you, asking you to forgive us even as we lack the ability to obey. You are gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, will and to work of your good pleasure in our hearts, so that we might return to you this day and every day, cause us to hunger and thirst after you and your righteousness that we might be satisfied today and every day. In your graciousness and mercy, restore unto us the joy of our salvation, knowing that you abound in steadfast love. Amen. Please pray for them.
Almighty God, we confess that no matter how good we have been, that our righteousness is but filthy rags before you. We confess, O oh Lord, that all the good religious activity and conduct that we have been consumed with, perhaps, Lord, can do nothing to satisfy, the, to pay the sin for the sin that we have committed just in one activity this past week. Lord, we confess we're sinners. But we also confess that the glory of our being is not in what we have done, the labor of our hands, but in the work of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior this day. God, we thank you for Christ. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying in our place. We come now and claim your righteousness, thanking you for your grace. Lord, this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, if you have trusted Christ as your Savior alone, if you have confessed your sin relying upon the righteousness of Jesus Christ as the payment for your sin, I can assure you on the basis of Psalm 118, you are forgiven. Listen to it. From my distress, I called upon the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me in a large place. The Lord is for me. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? Brothers and sisters, God is indeed for you. And in his grace, he sets you in a large space. The idea behind that is one that you can go, ah, thank you, God. And that's what he's given us by grace of the large space. Sin no longer should hamper us. We're no longer guilty. There's therefore now no condemnation. So again, if you've confessed your sin, relying upon Christ alone, we can assure you on the authority of God's word that your sin is forgiven. Isn't that glorious? Today we stand before God guiltless. Let us respond to the Lord this day using Him 521, confessing that our hope is built on nothing less but Jesus' blood and His righteousness. Him 521. And let's stand. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone less to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Amen. Please be seated. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you. That passage is, of course, from Deuteronomy. 
And as you review this, you know, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that how many times were the Israelites asked to give? I, I think of the temple and the creation of that and all the giving that was done in that. I, I think of, of all of the times that this, that the Lord asked that they be, that an offering be taken and they were, they were that was exactly what happened. Now, you know, every Sunday we always come to this portion of the service and we talk about the difference between giving of your substance and giving of yourself. This is what's important. The idea here is that you don't place coin, a, a, a check, a, a bill in the plate, but you, you, God wants us. He wants all of us. He wants every bit of us. And that's what we're, we're often so reluctant to, to give. This passage reminds us that, first of all, what has he given us? He's given us everything. In fact, he's given us faith. And what a great gift that is. And because of that, we're here worshiping as his people. So in this time of dedication, I ask you to consider that as the ushers please serve us. Please pray with me. Mighty God, our Heavenly Father, as as we have noted, we are giving you but what you have given us. Lord, we are grateful that we have the ability to give. Lord, I ask that these gifts be used wisely in in this community, in this church, and beyond. Lord, we have many concerns as a body. And Lord, we turn our thoughts to those as well. Lord, we know that Uh, For example, Dave is not with us today as he visits his mom. We know that uh, her diagnosis was cancer, and we know that uh, the doctors in their wisdom have performed surgery, and we ask that it all be successful. We pray that Dave has a wonderful visit with his his family, and we ask for his safe return as well. Lord, on a happy note, we think of, of the marriages and engagements that have been announced within this body of the young people. And I'm I'm thinking of Ashley and Josh and their upcoming marriage, uh, Weston and and Alan and Richie, Ross and Lisa. And I pray that all of these couples be maintained in their purity, that, Lord, as they learn of each other and prepare for the wonderful uh, institution of marriage, one that uh, that is celebrated by the the wedding at Canaan, the the place where you performed your first miracle. Lord, what a blessing marriage is and what a model it is for the church and for all of us to understand what that means. So Lord, we do pray for them. Lord, we also know that there are many students that are departing. Some we've already prayed for and already gone. We've got more to 
to go, and I pray, as we have continually prayed, that they be ambassadors of you wherever, you, wherever they are, that they continue to share the face and affections of Christ to those uh, in, in places that, on the surface, perhaps, may be ostensibly Christian. And on the other hand, we know that, that the world creeps into everything. And so, Lord, I pray that they be strong in their faith, that they have been given by their parents, their own faith, that is their own faith, that you have given them as a free gift. Lord, we know there are many that are challenged for work, and I think of, of Kurt Stansberry, and I think of, of Dorothy and her, and her struggles with her supervisor, and I, and I think of, of Steve Musto as well, and there are others. Richard is, needs more work, and he needs uh, some, some direction as well as to where he should go. Lord, I would pray that everyone that is employed, there would be a hedge of protection around their work, that they, it would be very obvious as they work that they're not working for a particular employer, a particular boss, that they're really working for you, and that that be very obvious in everything that they, that they say and that they do. Lord, I also think of, to pray for the broad, more broadly for the body. I pray that, that this body would understand more fully the role of the, the Holy Spirit. Lord, when you walked this earth in Luke, you reminded us, for you said, for you then who are evil, how do you know to give, you give good gifts to your children? How much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask them? And Paul expanded on that when he wrote, to know the love of Christ surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. That fullness is only attainable, that we can only understand that through the role of the Holy Spirit. When the Lord, when Lord, when you left, you said it's a good thing that you would leave because you would leave the Spirit, the Comforter, behind. And so, Lord, as we understand what that, what the role of the Spirit is in exposing sin in our lives and, and convicting us of, of what we need to do in order to be more godly people, I pray that that would become more obvious to us. Lord, I pray that, God, you would vindicate your people and their cause. Now, again, the words of the Lord said, I will not then God will not, will not God vindicate his elect, those who cry to him day and night? Lord, we know that we're persecuted. We pray for the broader, the persecuted church in all places. Lord, we hear about ISIS. We hear about the things in the Middle East. And we know, too, that we're persecuted here, but in a different and more subtly, subtle way. For our culture wants to marginalize us, wants to place us, to make us irrelevant. And, Lord, that is a form of persecution. Lord, let us not become dulled or jaded by that, but again, to, to recognize that you have vindicated us, that you have lifted us up when we lift our eyes and fix them on you and your cross. Lord, how many times do we pray for unbelievers? Lord, we know that we have family members, and you've heard, we've heard clearly that as First John, as John writes, that the, the joy of seeing his children walking the Lord and how painful the flip side of that is, that how painful it is when people that we love, people that are our relatives, do not walk in the way of the Lord. As Paul wrote in Romans, brethren, my heart's desire is to, 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 for God to, for them is that they may know to be, that he would save them. And Lord, he was speaking of his Jewish brethren when he, when he said that. And, and Lord, it is the, the desire of our hearts that we would be your faithful witnesses. That again, as the Spirit works in these, we, we cannot argue anyone into the kingdom. We cannot convince anyone that the Spirit's work. But we're called, as Peter calls us, to always give a reason for our faith, reason for the hope that you have given us. So, Lord, as we, as we go forth from this place, help us to do so with a renewed dedication to you uh, to follow your ways. Pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's conclude our time of dedication by singing together hymn 251, Beneath the Cross of Jesus, 251. Please stand to sing. Beneath the cross of Jesus, I fain would take my stand. 
The shadow of a mighty rock within a weary land, a home within the wilderness that's rest upon the way, the burning of the noontide heat and the burden of the Upon the cross of Jesus, mine eye at times can see a very dying form of one who saw there for me. And from my stricken heart with tears to wonders I can. sunshine of his face, content to let the world go by, to know no gain nor loss, my sins of my only shame, my glory of the cross. Please be seated. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases to be, for the faithful disappear from among the sons of men. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace on the earth, refined seven times. You, O Lord, will keep them. You will preserve him from this generation forever. Yes, there are certainly times when we can feel that the faithful are disappearing from the earth. And how do we remain faithful? Only by being in his word. We're in his word when we read it, and we're in his word when we hear it proclaimed. So I ask you to prepare your hearts and minds to hear the word as Greg brings us, brings it to us. Brothers and sisters, turn your Bibles to the book of Daniel, chapter 8. Daniel, chapter 8, and as well in your bulletin, you will note that there is an outline. I encourage you to turn there as well and use that. Take notes, follow along, read the quotes that I'll be referencing. We continue to walk through Daniel a little bit slower than we've gone through the other prophets. Actually, not as slow as we went through Jeremiah and Isaiah, but we're going through this a little bit slower than the other ones. And uh, um, on purpose, we're going to look at each chapter. Um, after Daniel, by way of footnote, is Ezekiel. Um, so um, Habakkuk. Actually, I think it's Habakkuk. We haven't done Habakkuk yet. 605 as well. Habakkuk will be our next book, actually. Ezekiel will be after Habakkuk. So I'm, I'm sorry. So you can, you can start. Actually, don't yet. Keep on being a study in Daniel with me, but then in a couple of weeks, start looking at Habakkuk because that will be the next book we turn to. Daniel chapter 8, incredible chapter. We're into the prophetic section of Daniel 7 through 12, and uh, um, 8 is no exception. So this is indeed the word of Almighty God. Let me invite you to stand together with me out of reverence and respect at it, it, its reading. I'm going to read verses 1 to 15 to begin with. Hear now the word of, of your king. In the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, the king of the king, a vision appeared uh, to me. Daniel, subsequent to the one which appeared to me previously. And I looked in the vision, and it came about while I was looking that I was in the citadel of Susa, which is in the province of Elam. And I looked in the vision, and I myself was beside the Ulai Canal. Then I lifted my gaze and looked, and behold, a ram which had two horns was standing in the front of the canal, 
Now the two horns were long, but one was longer than the other, with the longer one coming up last. I saw the ram budding westward, northward, and southward, and no other beast could stand before him, nor was there anyone to rescue from his power, but he did as he pleased and magnified himself. While I was observing, behold, a male goat was coming from the west, over the surface of the whole earth, without touching the ground, and the goat had a, a conspicuous horn between his eyes. And he came up to the ram that had the two horns, which I had seen standing in front of the canal, and rushed at him in the mighty wrath. And I saw him come beside the ram, and he was in, in, enraged at, at, at him. And he struck the ram and shattered his two horns, and the ram had no strength to withstand him. So he hurled him to the ground and trampled on him, and there was none to rescue the ram from his power. Then the male goat magnified himself exceedingly, but as, as soon as he, he was mightily, the large horn was broken, and in its place there came up four uh, conspicuous horns toward the four winds of, of heaven. And out of one of them came forth a rather small horn, which grew exceedingly great towards the south, towards the east, and towards the beautiful land. And it grew up to the host of heaven, and caused some of the host and some of the stars to fall to the earth, and it trampled them down. It even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the hosts, and it removed the regular sacrifice from him, and the place of the sanctuary was thrown down. And on account of the transgression, the host will be given over to the horn, along with the regular sacrifice, and it will, be, and it will fling truth to the ground and perform its will and prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that particular one, who was speaking, how long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply while the transgression causes horror so as to allow both the holy place and the host to be trampled? And he said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. Thus far the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Lord, what a joy it is to bow here together with you now with your word open in our laps and soon in our laps. God, the privilege of the study of your word the, ga the gift that this is to us, the treasure. And then, Lord, the privilege to be in a place in a, in a time where we can study it free of persecution, free of fear. God, give us grace not to be indolent or lazy. Um, but, Lord, give us grace to be zealous students of your word as we study together, that we might receive your word humbly, and that, Lord, it might transform us, that we might be able better to honor you to glorify you, and to enjoy you. Father, we commit now this time to you. Give me grace to preach your word with fidelity. Give us grace to hear your word and fellowship with you through it. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. In your sermon notes, I've given you an example of what is known as forced perspective. The two picture theres are, are um, the, two, the top two are an example of forced perspective. Forced perspective is a term used in photography of when a, the photographer takes a picture of two things that are really far apart, but when he takes them, it looks like they're right next to each other. So the top one looks like those people are staying on top of that water bottle, but the reality is those people are way down, way far away. And he just put the camera at the right angle to make them look small. The next one, this guy, this this uh, golf ball looks mammoth. This man looks like a giant. And uh, again, they're, they're very far apart. But um, because of where they put the camera and the angle, it looks like they're right next to each other. It's called forced perspective. Well, forced perspective in the context of prophetic discourse is actually called dual fulfillment. Okay, dual uh, uh, fulfillment. Dual uh, fulfillment is where, from the perspective of the prophet, two future events separated by some time appear to be simultaneous and so announced as one. So from the perspective of the prophet, God gives him a vision of the future, and to him, he just looks like one thing. He doesn't realize that there are multiple events that he doesn't see, he just sees one event. For example, Isaiah chapter 7 is the classic example. Isaiah 7, Ahaz is being attacked by, by Syria and Jerusalem, or, um, uh, Samaria, and um, he's going to be deposed if he doesn't join their, their league, you know, their anti-Assyrian league. And so 
Um, he's going to go there and compromise. Instead, he sends a letter actually to the Assyrians. But Isaiah meets him in Isaiah 7 and says, Ahaz, trust God. He, he's bigger than those foes. Don't worry about him. Trust God. And, and Ahaz um, says, no, um, you know, I, well, he didn't say no yet. But um, he, there's some banter. And then eventually Isaiah says, God will give you a sign. Isaiah 7, 14. The Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and will bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. There was probably a very well-known marriage, and there was a young maiden who had a baby, who was about to have a baby at this time in Isaiah. And when that baby was old enough to know right from wrong, Syria and Amistriel would be gone. Now we know from Matthew chapter 1 that Isaiah was actually prophesying about two births. There was a birth in Isaiah's day, but there was also that prophecy was of a greater birth in Matthew 1. In Christ's day, Matthew 1, 22, all this took place that was spoken through the Lord, uh, through the prophet Isaiah, might be fulfilled, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. So we've looked at this tool. It's a prophetic tool. It's called dual fulfillment, where oftentimes a prophecy that is given in the Bible has two reference in mind. Now, the only way we can say there's two is if God's word says it. So we're not free in the Old Testament to say, oh, this must have two in mind. We, no, it, unless God's word says it, we don't posit dual uh, fulfillment. That's an important concept to bear in mind as you look at Daniel. Daniel 7 through 12 is the prophetic section of Daniel. And it was given to encourage God's people in the time of, of suffering. And its relevancy for us is found in that it is uh, an example of dual fulfillment. Uh, fulfillment. What is prophesied here in Daniel chapter 8 took place in the um, next two, three hundred years, but it also is fulfilled in a greater way in our age. And we'll look at that this morning. Again, I, re I draw your attention to the fact that Daniel was in exile, the first prophet in exile, to write in exile to exiles struggling. So Daniel was brought into exile when he was a 13 to 15 year old boy, 605 BC. And Daniel chapter 1 starts. And there he begins addressing pastorally the people of God in exile. Now, he does, may not realize how God's going to use it, but that's what Daniel's for. Daniel answers two questions, as we've seen. The first chapter answers the first one and throughout. You love Christ, but your world's been turned upside down. The nation's been turned over, 605. You're six. Uh, a five, uh, I'm sorry, 586, uh, uh, 20 years uh, later, hundreds of thousands would be brought into exile. If they loved Christ, what were they to do? I mean, their world's been turned upside down. Daniel 1 says, prepare your hearts not to compromise. Love God. Serve God. Honor God. Worship God. Trust His goodness. And that is for us today, brothers and sisters. You've been given cancer. You've lost your job. You've got a difficult providence that you're dealing with. Daniel comes with beautiful words to our hungry soul. Trust God. Prepare your hearts right now, brothers and sisters, to trust God, to serve God, to love God, not to doubt Him, but to cling to Him. That's Daniel 1, and he repeats that uh, throughout. Daniel chapter 2 through 12 focuses more on Okay, now that we're trusting God, what is there to encourage us in this difficult time? We want to trust God. We want to love Him, don't we? As God's people, we want to be a people who serve Him. No matter what comes our way. Well, what is there in God's Word to encourage the pilgrim, the, the, the alien scattered? That's what P uh, Peter calls us using the language of the exile. Christians are alien scattered. What, what is there to encourage us towards this end? Well, Daniel 2 through 12. Now, we've seen already six. And it is simply this. Rejoice, our God is great, and so rules kings and nations. Rejoice, our God is holy, and therefore has, the plan, has a plan that is beyond your ability to understand. Rejoice, our God reigns, and so holds the heart of the king in his hands. By way of footnote, Nebuchadnezzar brought those messages to God's people. 
In the ancient world, if you were brought into exile, you would have been told your God is weak, your God doesn't reign, our God is great, our God is strong. Ironically, it was the exact opposite. The people going into exile were told not by God's people, but by their captors, Nebuchadnezzar, their king, that what would become their king. Your God is great. Trust him. Incredible. God then used Belshazzar, fourth, our God is jealous, and so will not allow himself and so the believer to be mocked. Cyrus, God's way is infallible, and so makes no mistakes when it comes to the child of God. Hey, brothers and sisters, your world may be turned upside down, but God didn't go off the throne, and you are right where God wants you. Incredible. Last week, now, this message brought to you by God himself, 7 through 12. Last week, in the end, God's people win. Can you hold on longer, brothers and sisters? The day is going to come when you and I are standing in the new heavens and the new earth, worshiping God in the flesh, where there's no more sin, no more sorrow, no more misery. In the end, we win. Until then, hold out and trust God. Today, we see another one, a seventh Encouragement. Until the end, God's kingdom will suffer violence. My title is Sweet and Sober Truths and Bitter uh, Providences. This is more of a sober truth. Okay? And that is God's kingdom is going to suffer violence until the end. Notice with me the preface, verse 1. We'll just walk away through. In the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, the king, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, subsequent to the one which appeared to me previously. Two things real, real quickly. First of all, Daniel times this to the third year of Belshazzar. We saw last time in chapter 1. It's the first year. And he was in his late 60s here. It's 550 to 548, most scholars uh, believe, which means Daniel would have been in his late 60s, early 70s when he wrote this, or when he had this vision. Secondly, would you notice the phrase, subsequent to the one which appeared to me previously? Scholars are united in saying that because of that reference, Daniel chapter 8 is intricately united to chapter 7. Whatever he said in 7 somehow re relates to chapter 8 because Daniel relates the two uh, visions. Okay? Um, and we're going to return to that at the end. Notice the vision, verses 2 through 14. We'll pick it up in verse 2. I looked in the vision, and it, be, and it came about while I was looking, that while I was in the citadel, the fortress of Susa, which, in the province, which is in the province of Elam, and I looked in the vision, and I myself was beside the, the Ulai a Canal. Real quickly, two things. Daniel had this vision in Babylon. But in his vision, he's transported to Susa, which, became, which was a capital of Elam, and would become a very um, important city, for the Persians. He's standing behind the Ulai a Canal, which was a man-made, massive waterway. Eventually, Alexander would sail his ships up this canal. So it's this massive man-made structure. Daniel's there. And notice with me verse 3 and 5. Then I lifted up my gaze and looked, and behold, a ram which had two horns was standing in front of the canal. Now the two horns were long, but one was longer than the other, with the longer one coming up last. Skip down to verse 5. While I was observing, behold, a male goat was coming from the west over the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. The idea is that it's swift. And the goat had a conspicuous horn between its eyes. Now we're going to see in verses 20 through 26 that Dan, uh, Daniel here is seeing a, a vision of the Medo-Persian Empire, that's the ram, and Greece, that's the goat. This Medo Empire, Medo Persian Empire, would rise first and thoroughly conquer and destroy the ancient world, conquer Babylon, and then destroy the ancient world. And then after this, the goat would come. Um, actually, in 11 years, um, the Medo Persians would rise up, this ram, and destroy the uh, uh, Babylonians based upon where Daniel was at this point. And then about 200 years later, the Greeks would rise up with Alexander. He's the horn in uh, the middle. Would you notice verse 8? Then the male goat, speaking of this male goat, magnified himself exceedingly, but as soon as he was mighty, the large horn was broken, and in its place there came up four conspicuous horns towards the four winds of, of heaven. If you know your history, you know Alexander's rise was meteoric, flash in the pan. Um, he became general king of the Greeks in, when he was age 21. At the age of 26, he had virtually conquered the world. Five years. 
He'd live more years after that on his way home from his conquest. At the age of 33, he would die. So he was a flash in the pan, a quick, on the scene, conquer uh, the world. Then he died. And that's exactly what is being spoken about here. As soon as he was mighty, the large horn was broken. And in its place came up four uh, conspicuous horns. After Alexander died, his kingdom was divvied up between his four generals, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. But would you notice verses 9 through 11? Of these four generals, one of the generals, one of the horns, would come another horn. Notice verse 9. And out of one of them came forth a rather small horn. We know this to be Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus IV, for those of you who know your history, which grew up exceedingly great towards the south, towards the east, and towards the beautiful land. That's the promised land. And it grew up to the host of heaven and caused some of the host and some of the stars to fall uh, to the earth. Now, normally in the Old Testament, hosts and stars reference stars. Hosts reference stars. The Lord of hosts references the Lord of the stars and or angels. Here, it's very clear as used in Isaiah, the host here is in reference to kings or generals. That this... Um, man rose up and immediately killed and conquered other would-be generals, other would-be kings. He trampled them down. It even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the host. Commander of the host is an Old Testament equivalent to king of kings. Okay, He made himself equal to the king of kings, to the commander of the host. And this horn removed the regular sacrifice from God and the place of his sanctuary was thrown down. All right, we're going to talk about this in more detail in just a bit because we have an interpretation here in this passage. But for now, recognize whatever Daniel's prophesying, he's prophesying about a time of great tribulation, great persecution, great suffering. So God's people, we saw this last time in part, God's people have just left um, their homeland, they've been turned upside down, they've seen brutal suffering, and they've come to this land, and the false prophets, of course, as we'll see in Ezekiel, the first word that they hear is, don't worry, you'll go back in just two years. I promise. God's not going to let you do this. God's too big. Daniel comes and says, no, this is for 70 years. Jeremiah said it as well. This is for 70 years. And then Daniel says, and brothers, after that, it's going to get worse. You think it's bad now? Wait till it, wait for 200 years. Wait till these horns come and, and they conquer the world. Wait for the Persians and the Medes, referenced here by name. Wait for the Greeks. Man, you haven't seen anything yet. If you think you've suffered yet, it's going to get worse. And this suffering is going to be attacking God and his sanctuary. He's going to tear it down. Notice with me verses 13 through 14 gives us the duration. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that particular one who was speaking, How long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply while the transgression causes horror, so as to allow both the holy place and the host to be trampled? And he said to me, For 2,300 evenings and mornings, even the holy place will be properly restored. All right, 2,300 evenings and mornings. The Hebrew literally reads 2,300 morning and evenings. The idea behind that is the sacrificial system. So there was a morning sacrifice and an evening sacrifice. There would be 2,300 morning and evening sacrifices from the time, from the duration, from when the, the temple was destroyed or turned over to when it would be renewed. And that, if you do your calculation, is a little bit over three years. And that's exactly how long the temple sacrifices were ceased when Antiochus Epiphanes went in and destroyed and sacrificed the pig on the altar um, and defiled the sanctuary. Three and a half years later, Mattathias, the father of the Maccabees, he came and cleansed the temple. That's where we get Hanukkah from, right? That's where the Jews uh, get Hanukkah. The, the oil was only enough for one day, but it lasted, what is it, 12? Um, and so... The result is, or is it seven? I don't know, guys. It's seven? Thank you. It's seven days. Um, that's where it came from. Well, that's this time. And the point is, brothers and sisters, and I've referenced it there, and you can read it. I haven't gone into specificity because we're going to go into great specificity in chapters 11 through 12. Daniel comes back with another vision on this exact history in Daniel 11 through 12. So we're going to come back to that in more detail later. But for right now, would you notice... 
that the vision before us, and I've written this in your, in your notes, the vision before us um, is one of treachery and horror. What was vaguely referenced in chapter 7 is here highlighted. The future for God's people was going to be extremely difficult. From this, we conclude that truly this world is not a friend to grace to help us on our way. It is both a veil of tears in which God has deigned to perfect us through suffering, as well as a battleground in which Satan endeavors to attack the servants of God. It's that latter part that Daniel's focusing on here. Brothers and sisters, Daniel is saying, God has not left the throne. God is on that throne. But you've got to understand something. Redemptive history is maturing. You and I might think that, oh, man, when I got married when I was, I got married when I was 21. When I got married when I was 21, my health and my marriage would be that way forever. It's not going to remain that way. God's plan for me is more than that. It's bigger than that, right? Same thing here. They were in the, the time of the nation, and they were a nation. Things were great. And they, from their perspective, what could be better? We look back, and we look at the exile as a blip. The nation is a blip. We know that all of that was a foretaste of what Jesus Christ would do when he came. So we look back upon this history and go, whatever. You've got to realize, brothers and sisters, that at the time, their world was turned upside down. And Daniel's saying, brothers and sisters, you're in a battle zone. Yes, God took you. You're here. God's sovereign. He's on the throne. He'll protect you. But you've got to realize, you're soldiers. And you are going to be in the thick of the battle. That's Daniel chapter 8. Now notice, in the context of this horrible news, and it really is, if you think about it, you think it's bad now, Christian? You ain't seen nothing yet. Thank you, Daniel, <laughs> for the encouraging words. Okay? In the context of this, once again, Hebrew is more inclined to show it than say it. Closest genre we have today of Hebrew is stage play. So Hebrew is going to let us decide many times who the good guy is, who the bad guy is, right? Eli, was he a good guy or a bad guy? Saul, good guy, bad guy. Likewise here, the way that Daniel constructs this chapter is beautiful. We don't need 15 through 19. We really don't. So why did Daniel stick it in? Because he's writing for the people of God who no doubt would be burdened, overburdened by the knowledge that their future is going to be hard. And Daniel comes, would you notice a glorious contrast in verses 15 through 16. It came about when I, Daniel, had seen the vision that I sought to understand it. And behold, and in the Hebrew, you are never going to believe this. Standing before me was one who looked like a man. And I heard the voice of the man between the banks of the, of the Uli. And he called out and said, Gabriel, give this man an understanding of the vision. Daniel is the only Old Testament prophet that, that references the angels by name. Michael chapter 10 Gabriel chapter 9. And in this vision, Daniel um, sees Gabriel, who's told to explain the vision, what Daniel just saw to him. And at this moment, Daniel is undone. Get this, it's beautiful. Daniel has just, with horror, remember chapter 7? He's burdened. Do you remember that? That was last week. He's burdened by what he sees. You can only guess that this is more of the same, and Daniel here is going to be overwrought and, and just burdened by what he sees. And lo and behold, do you know what burdens him? It's not what he sees in terms of the future. It's, what, it's, the, it's, the, it's the presence of the being in whom he is, by whom he is, is standing. Notice verses 17 through 18. So he came near to where I was standing, and when I came, and when he came, I was frightened. And fell on my face. The idea behind this is he was quaking. He couldn't stand, brothers and sisters. He was so overburdened by the presence of this being. Okay, keep on going. But he said to me, Son of man, understand that the vision pertains to the time of the end. Now while he was talking with me, I sank into a deep sleep with my face to the ground. He couldn't handle it. In a, a finite, mortal Mutable beings are always going to be at a loss in the presence of anything associated with God. That's how awesome God is. So Daniel here is in the presence not of Christ, but of an angel. And he can barely stand it. He can't stand it. He falls down. He's trembling. He's quaking. And brothers, what an important message for the people of God. 
You know what truly is awesome, brothers and sisters? It's, it's not knowing that in 200 years, 40,000 Jews will be killed in three nights. It, it, it's not in, in two years. A nuclear bomb is going to go off and melt everything within a 50-mile radius of Denver. That may seem awesome, but when you compare that to the great I Am, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, all of that becomes what Paul calls a passing burden. 2 Corinthians 4. A momentary light affliction. That's all that it is. So what an incredible Hebrew, again, Daniel doesn't say, don't be burdened by this, brothers and sisters. He's showing it. He's showing us, the reader of this, but don't be frazzled. Don't run around with the, like a chicken with the head uh, cut off. Don't, don't be um, uh, shaken from your uh, composure. You got cancer. You're probably going to die a horrible death, if not this year, in 20 years. Who knows what God's going to do? Okay? We're going to lose loved ones. We're going to lose our health. We might lose our job. Brothers and sisters, this world is a veil of tears. We're aliens and strangers in this world. It's going to be hard. But Daniel says, don't let the things of this world overburden you when you have a God who's infinite, eternal, unchangeable, who reigns over this world. Look at chapters 2 through 7. That's the being you ought to fear. I remember years ago when I was in seminary, we were in evening service and we had open prayer time and a young man opened, uh, raised his hand. He was a visitor and he raised his hand and said, please pray uh, for me. I got to take a flight and I'm dreadfully frightened of flying. And uh, one of the elders said, I'll take that one. And I was thankful because I didn't know how to pray for him. Um, this guy was a peer probably. And this elder got up and he said, Lord, we pray for this brother. We, we pray that you would keep him safe, da, 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 da. But then he ended it with saying, but Lord, we pray more than anything else that you would teach him to fear you more than fearing flying. I heard that thought, amen. Fearing flying when God holds the plane with his fingers in the air? Fearing cancer? Fearing uh, a surgery when God holds the scalpel in his hand? What could go wrong when you've got a God that great? That's the point of Daniel 12, uh, 15 through 19. So with that glorious uh, um, break, uh, a commercial break, we get back to the vision. Notice with me the vision explained 20 through 26. Now we're ready to hear the vision. Nothing can disturb us now. God is great, and he loves us. Wow. Notice with me verse 20. The ram which you saw with the two horns represents the kings of Media and Persia. And the shaggy goat represents the kingdom of Greece, and the large horn that is between his eyes, the first king. Now, if you read history books, you'll read that Philip, Alexander's dad, was the first king. He wasn't. He, of course, was trying to unify Greece, but it was under his son. He was executed or he was assassinated. It was under his son, Alexander, who served as the first king over unified Greece. So um, Greece and the large horn that is between his eyes is the first king. And the broken horn and the four horns that arose in his place represent four kingdoms which will arise from his nation, although not with his power. Um, just question, or, or, or just note, if there's any question as to what these two creatures were, ram, goat, it's, it's, it's certainly clarified here. Okay, the ram, the media Persian empire that would rise up in 11 short years from Daniel chapter 8 and rule for t uh, 200. And then in, in the 4th century, the Greeks would come and rise up. Alexander would, would rule for a little bit less than, than 10, or a little bit more than 10 years, 12 years age of 21 to, to 33. And then he would die, and then his kingdom would be divvy, divvied up to his four generals. Seleucus would get Palestine, Syria, Asia, and the east. The Ptolemy, or, or Ptolemy, would get Egypt and Palestine. So uh, Seleucus and the Ptolemies would fight over um, uh, Palestine. Antigonus would get Asia Minor, and Antipater would get Macedonia and Thrace. Notice with me, focusing on the Seleucid Empire, 23 through 24. And in the latter period of their rule, 
when the transgressions have run their course, a king will arise insolent and skilled in intrigue, and his power will be mighty, but not by his own power. Now, this is Antiochus Epiphanes. Now, I've written all this here because I didn't want you to have to take notes and just follow along. I'm going to read it, okay? Follow along. In 169 B.C., Antiochus IV, the, the was who called himself Theos Epiphanes, which means th- uh, um, God incarnate, traveled to Jerusalem where he replaced the high priest with the man of his own choosing. He then invaded Egypt, and while there, a rumor of his death circulated amongst the Jews, much to their joy. Not surprisingly, efforts were made to reinstate the genuine high priest whom Antiochus deposed. Yet Antiochus wasn't dead. When he received word, Jerusalem was revol- uh, uh, revolting against the high priest he installed, that, that he had installed. He accused the Jewish people of rebellion, savagingly attacked and sacked Jerusalem, and executed tens of thousands of its inhabitants. It is said that 40,000 people were, were, were executed within the space of three days. He then traveled back to Jerusalem, so that was his, his, his army. He personally traveled back to Jerusalem where he entered the Holy of Holies in the temple. There he sacrificed a pig on the altar of burnt offerings, defiled the temple precincts, took the sacred furniture, and reestablished Menelius as the high priest. This is what is known as the um, abomination of desolation with Daniel references in Daniel chapter 11. Antiochus set up an altar to Zeus. And he sacrificed a pig on it, and we'll read here in just a second, he'll even sacrifice humans in the temple, on the temple mount, on the mercy seat. Okay, notice my fourth, my fourth point. This understandably resulted in a major rebellion on the part of the Jews, to which Antiochus reacted with the religious persecution of unprecedented bitterness. More than 20,000 of his soldiers massacred the Jews assembled for worship on a Sabbath day. This was the time where, because it was a Sabbath, the Jews wouldn't lift up a sword because they felt it was a work they couldn't do on Sunday. And so they mass- they just hacked them. They'd sit there and stand there and they just hacked them up. Sabbath keeping and the, rep- and the practice of circumcision were then outlawed upon the pain of death. If they found that you were observing the Sabbath, they would chop you up in the way, way, easy way because you wouldn't defend yourself. And literally, that's what they would do. They'd come at you. Soldiers on Sunday would see a Jew. They'd take a sword or their, their hatchet and come and act like they're going to Attack, and if the person didn't defend themselves, they were of Sabbath keepers. They they then finished the job. Unclean meat was mandatory fare. You had to eat unclean meat, and the Sabbath and other feast days were profaned. Pagan sacrifices and prostitution were established in the temple, and a statute of Zeus was placed in the temple to which human sacrifices were offered on the altar. And again, that is what is known as the abomination of desolation. Wow. We're going to talk more about this. We get to Daniel chapter 11 and 12 because Daniel comes back and gives incredible detail as to what happened politically at this time. However, that brings us to the point. What is the point of this message? That's the vision. What's the point? Well, before we answer that, I want to know. I want you to, to note three phrases um, that is found throughout chapter eight, and it's basically all referencing to the set period. Would you notice 17b? Look with me at verse 17b. Gabriel speaking to Daniel said, But he said to me, Son of man, understand that the vision pertains to the time of the end. Notice verse 19. Furthermore, he said, Behold, I'm going to let you know what will occur at the final period of, uh, of the indignation, for it pertains to the appointed time of the end. 26. And the vision of the evening and mornings which had been told is true, but keep the vision secret, for it pertains to many days in the future. All these references give us a time indicator for the fulfillment of this prophecy. And just to let you know, if this was the New Covenant, the New Testament, these, this language would make you think of the end of this era. Okay? The end of this age. But in the Old Testament, this phrase is frequently used, and when it's used, it doesn't refer to the end of this age. It always refers to the end of the current situation that they're in. So we do not take Daniel chapter 8 as a prophecy a direct prophecy of our era. It isn't. It's clearly about Alexander and Antiochus Epiphanes and the persecution which God's people would suffer under during this time. So throughout, from Daniel through 
Antiochus, persecution would be going on. We know that. We know that throughout this verse. Ch uh, uh, chapter 7, 5 tells us that there would be persecution. Um, chapter si uh, 7, 6, 19, 21, and 23, and 25. 8, verse 4. It's just a time of persecution. As we said, the message of Daniel here is, brothers and sisters, you think you've suffered, you haven't seen anything yet, it's going to get worse. However, at the very end of this era that Daniel's speaking about, there'd be an intensification. Notice with me 25 through 20, or 24 through 25. Speaking of, of Antiochus, and his power will be mighty, but not by his own power, and he will destroy to an extraordinarily, to an, an extraordinary degree, and prosper and perform his will. Brother, he's talking about a mass sacrifice, mass of executions. He will destroy mighty men, and the holy people will be the object of his ire. Through his shrewdness, he will cause deceit to succeed by his influence, and he will magnify himself in his heart. He will destroy many while they are at ease. He will even oppose the prince of princes. So we saw, we, we already saw, have seen this. This era would be time of suffering, but at the very end, which is Antiochus Epiphanes, there'd be this climax, this intensification of suffering. Now, that's the prophecy here. However, we know that this has dual uh, fulfillment. We know that what God gave Daniel, Daniel was speaking about that era. But we know from the rest of Scripture that Daniel also is speaking about the end time. Listen to Matthew chapter 24, 15 through 16. Speaking of the last days, Christ said, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then let those who are in, in uh, Judea flee to the mountains. From that passage, we conclude Daniel 8 was written to encourage people in exile. We know from 1 Peter 4, Peter calls Christians still in exile, even though Christ has come. He still, God still views us as aliens and strangers in this world. From Matthew chapter 24, we conclude that the abomination of desolation is still yet uh, to come. And this is where, therefore, we come back to chapter 8, verse 1, and that reference subsequent to the one which appeared to me previously. Go back to chapter 7. In chapter 7, we see a vision of three of four different kingdoms, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans. Daniel chapter 8, the vision focuses on the middle two, the Persians, the, Medi the Medo-Persians, and the Greeks. During chapter 7, we saw that there would be many antichrists sent into the world. This Antichrist would come to its uh, fruition in an Antichrist figure at the end of the world. We understand that. Daniel chapter 8 is therefore an example of one such rise of an Antichrist. Antiochus Epiphanes. He's not the Antichrist. He's a, a Antichrist. And as a Antichrist, and as an era of suffering and persecution, we conclude from Matthew 24 that what we read here is germane for us. So the same message that Daniel gave to his people in exile, struggling under what's going to happen, we get the same message to us. It's very, very applicable, brothers and sisters. I hope you see. And the applicableness is simply this. Brothers and sisters, God saved you to be a soldier of Christ. Not only does God reign, not only does God is He holy, not only is He great, not only is He jealous, not only is His way um, infallible, not only in the end do we win, but brothers and sisters, until the end time, God's kingdom, and if you're a child of God, you're one of His soldiers, God's kingdom is going to suffer violence, and you and I are called to stand up to it. You and I are called to do battle, to engage, to fight. Now, what's the nature of this battle? Oh, I know. So we're supposed to strap bombs on our bodies and blow up innocent people, right? Like satanic Islam, right? No. Notice the nature of the attacks of Satan. 
And that's how we're going to end this. Notice with me, there are five of them. I will reference chapter 7, though. Last time we began there, 725. This is zero, if, you're, if you were to note it, zero. Um, number zero is 725. Satan will, will labor to wear us down. That was last week. He's going to wear us down. You know what Paul said? Do not grow weary in doing well. The inclination as a Christian is to wear down. That will be one of, the, one of the strategies of Satan, to wear us down. I've been reading the Word of God nonstop for 40 years, and my life just gets, keeps getting worse. So why read? I go to church. I give my, my money. I serve on the committees. And I lose my job. So why do those things? Brothers and sisters, again, get out of the idea that what we do, God's going to reward you on it. Get out of that. We do these things as unto the Lord, Colossians 3, right? And that, if that's the case, then don't grow weary. Don't let any person or force cause you to compromise your fidelity to Christ. Don't let any teacher, any professor, any, any preacher cause you to compromise your fidelity to Christ and his word. Secondly, or first, attack in chapter 8. Notice verses 11 through 13. I purposely skipped over these verses because I want to end with them. Notice 11 and, and 13. Speaking of the, uh, of the horn, for, uh, notice the kind of persecution that we're going to suffer. It even magnified itself to be equal with the commander of the host. And it removed the regular sacrifice from him. And the place of his, of his sanctuary was thrown down. Skip down to verse 13. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that a particular one who was speaking, How long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply while the transgression causes horror, so as to allow both the holy place and the host to be trampled? Brothers and sisters, the Tower of Babel was the first organized attack against God in terms of a religious attack. And that has continued ever since. Satan wants our worship, and because he can't get it, because he won't get it, he's going to do everything he can to ruin God's worship. Now, during the prophetic era, the way that Satan did that was through Baalism. We've talked a lot about that. And brothers and sisters, as we have seen, as I have exhorted you many, many times, today Baalism is big in our culture. We live in a Baalistic culture, and Baalism is seep seeping into the church. What is Baalism? Baalism simply defined is this, confusing emotion with genuine worship. In Baalism, the focus was feeling a certain way. Today, in our worship services, we um, uh, uh, confuse how we feel with genuine worship, believing that if we feel a certain way at church, we've worshipped God. Brothers and sisters, that's Baalism. Now, hear me carefully. Please hear me carefully. If you today were singing one of the hymns or praying and you were moved emotionally, if hearing the word of God moves you emotionally, that is not Baalism. And there's nothing wrong with that. Did you hear that? I am not, we are not, the Bible is not poo-pooing emotion. What the problem is, is when emotion takes the place of worship. That's the problem. My, I think of this in this way. I play football, and I play it because sometimes when you win, you have the elation of victory. Well, brothers and sisters, we can manufacture the elation of, of victory with music and what you visually see and drugs. So if the objective of winning is to feel a certain way, then you can win by feeling, right? So you don't have to play the game anymore. Just go feel a certain way, and you've won a football game. Everyone says that. That's ludicrous. You haven't won unless you win in the score. And if you do, you might feel a certain way. You may not, depending on how you played or if you sat at the bench. You understand? The focus is not how you feel. The focus is on here worshiping God acceptably and most honorably. And if that moves you to an emotional response, I hope it does. We're human beings, not robots. I hope it does. But the objective is not how you feel. That's Baalism. Brothers and sisters, that's alive and well uh, today. Augustine battled it. Notice his quote. I am inclined, though I pronounce no irrevocable opinion on the subject, to approve of the use of singing in the church, so that by the delights of the ear the weaker minds may be stimulated to a devotional mood. Yet when it happens that I am more moved by the singing than by what is sung, I confess myself to have sinned wickedly. And then I would rather not have heard the singing at all. 
Brothers and sisters, today we live in a world where the focus of the church is on being moved by singing, by preaching, by theatrics. That's Baalism. Redivivus. That means reborn. It's Baalism repackaged. Brothers and sisters, the attack is alive and well today. It's our call to strive to teach our children, to teach each other, to encourage each other, to worship God acceptably, most honorably, which is according to his word, and by hearts that mean it. Second attack, verse 12. Notice verse 12. And on account of transgressions, the host will be given over to the horn along with the regular sacrifice. By way of footnote in the Hebrew, that is almost unintelligible. This is a okay translation, but no one really knows what that first part means. But it does not, we know what the second part means. And it will fling truth to the ground and perform its will and prosper. Another way that Satan attacks is by throwing truth to the ground. Ken earlier in during service said, you know, we, we prayed. We live in, an, in a time of persecution. And in the United States, it's different. This is how it is here, brothers and sisters. I'm not fearing East is going to come down the street and chop off my head. That would probably be easier than living in a wealthy land where, where our hearts can grow easily cold. Give me neither poverty nor riches, right? Lest I be full and deny thee and say, who is the Lord, says the psalmist. That's our world. And in our world, Satan is throwing, flinging truth to the ground, or as one man put it, dragging truth through the mud. Satan's a liar, and therefore everything he does is going to involve deceit. And we live in that day, brothers and sisters, where this battle, this uh, front is under great attack in the U.S. Isn't it? I dare you. I dare any one of you today. I dare you. Stand in a public forum and stare out to that crowd and say homosexuality is a deviant lifestyle and a sin. I dare you to. You will be persecuted. Brothers and sisters, biblically speaking, I, this is not a personal opinion of Greg Thurston. This is what the Bible teaches. It is a deviant lifestyle, a deviant act, and a sin. It is. Now, it's a forgivable sin. I don't want to demonize anyone who is who has fallen prey to that sin any more than I want to demonize anyone who's proud or arrogant. Paul, in his, in his list of things that are sin, he referenced homosexuality and pride in, in the same breath. So let's not demonize it. Let's not exalt it. But brothers and sisters, t today there's an attack on truth. And if you proclaim the truth, you're going to be persecuted. You will. I dare you to go on a college campus and say in a classroom, students, evolution is a religion. It is. It's not a science. It's a faith-based belief. It's not, you cannot prove it scientifically, right? It's as much of a religion as a creation, by way of footnote. Creation is a religion and not a science. It both are religious holdings. One just so happens to take less faith, okay? But both are religious holdings, Say that today on a college campus. You'll be laughed at. You'll be persecuted. You'll be attacked. Stand on a street uh, corner and say you shouldn't work or sport on Sunday. Say that premarital sex is an egregious sin. Did you know that they recently did a survey of 18 to 25-year-old evangelical men and women? 18 to 25-year-old people who called themselves evangelical Christians. And what they determined was... From the age of 18 to 25, this generation today believes that the Ten Commandments are optional. Criminal sex, not a problem. Lying, deceit, not, not a problem. Guys, there's an attack on truth uh, today like never before. Um, Satan um, is a, a liar. Romans 1 describes the era in which we live. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. Brothers and sisters, that's the age in which we live. Our world has exchanged the truth for a lie. So, <laughs> brothers and sisters, Daniel says it's going to be a hard, hard go. And this goal means attack. Truth is being attacked. In the words of Luther, you will find the, the, the faithfulness of a soldier, not because he stands on every front, but because he stands on the front that's being attacked most, most greatly, right? Or greatly. 
That's where you know the faithfulness of a soldier. Brothers and sisters, the truth is under attack. Worship is under attack. Would you notice Christians are under attack? Verse 24. And his power will be mighty, but, but not by his own power. He will destroy to an extraordinary degree and prosper and perform his will. He will, he will destroy mighty men and the holy people. We are not experiencing that as severe clearly in the U.S., but brothers and sisters and the Near East, the Arab world, India, Africa, China, your brothers and sisters, our brothers and sisters are being hung up and killed as we speak. If you're not being persecuted, I hope you're praying. Because brothers and sisters are, 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 are experiencing this right now. May God give us, us in our wealthy, healthy land, the grace to be prayer warriors for these brothers and sisters. How would you pray? Think of Stephen. I prayed uh, this morning as I was doing this, I, was, I, I began praying, God, I pray for the brother sister this day, this very moment, this day, this week, who will be facing their demise. Grant them the grace to behold by faith their Savior, that Christ would be that which moves them more than the blade or the knife or the threat of despotic people. Grant them the grace to behold Christ and to be moved by him as Stephen was when he's being martyred. That's how you pray for a martyred person. Notice, brothers, number four, deceit will be promoted. Verse 25, and th through his shrewdness, he will cause deceit to succeed by its influence. Very similar to the point up above about truth being attacked, verse 12. But there's a difference here. It's one thing to attack truth. It's another thing to promote deceit. Look, I'm not, I'm not trying to harp on homosexuality, I rarely mention this, but this just gives itself to it. Brothers and sisters, we live in an age, 30 years ago, you could say homosexuality is a sin, but love the sinner, right? Hate the sin, love the sinner. It's a sin, but it's a forgivable sin. Let's minister and love them. Let's minister and love proud people. Let's minister and love, name it, okay? Today, you cannot think homosexuality is deviant. Did you know that? That's the culture in which we live. Not only can you not say that it's wrong, but now it's the opposite. The agenda of the, of the U.S. and the world it will not be happy until you and I believe it's a good lifestyle. You understand that? Incredible. Now, what else is there? You and I have to believe that church is stupid. You and I have to believe that this is simply a religion um, of fancy. You and I have to believe. What other things? Brothers and sisters, that's where deceit is flourishes. That's the world in which we live. It was not content for us simply to say that that's wrong. We have to say it's right. I remember when I was in seminary and chapel, there was a man. He was um, a, uh, a former drug lord in a communistic country in South America. Okay? Cuba. He was a drug lord. And while he was doing his drugs, murdering people, Killing, stealing, raping, guilty of all that. No problem. He was an acceptable member of the society. But then when he became a Christian, he was locked up and put in prison. So he, he's out murdering, raping, pillaging, and burning, and he's an okay guy. But he becomes a Christian, they lock him away. This is, what he, this is what he said, quote, The most dangerous threat to communism is thought. Communism doesn't want their people to think. That is why I was put in prison. Christianity made me a thinker, and communism can't endure that, unquote. That's the world in which we live. They don't want you to think. They'll do the thinking for you. Just watch your television shows, and it'll tell you how to think about things. Brothers and sisters, that's another front. Deceit is on the rise. Then finally, 25C, and he will oppose even the prince of princes. We're going to wrap this up now. Christ, uh, Satan's ultimate focus, Revelation 12, is Satan or is is Christ. That's who this world hates is Christ. And so, even though you and I may be great citizens, we pay our taxes, we we don't, um, you know, break the law. Nevertheless, our world will not live in a world that endures you or me. Be prepared; it's going to get worse. What's the point? The point's this, Daniel says. Brothers and sisters, you've entered into an era of your existence where you are going to be attacked and persecuted. And this is how. Physical, 
Truth will be attacked. Deceit will be exalted. Worship will be attacked. Christ will be attacked. Expect it. I'm going to close with this verse. Paul later on, we we could almost summarize a a third of, this chapter could be summarized by a third of what Paul says here, 2 Corinthians 10. Paul told the believers, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Notice the threefold battle. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. That's Daniel chapter 8. Truth, deceit, worship, Christ. Engage the culture, brothers and sisters. Don't you dare shrink back. Be willing to be persecuted because you say, look, like pride, homosexuality is a sin. Like stealing, pride is a sin. Like, like, like pride, um, a premarital sex is a sin. Don't shrink back. Stand for the truth. Secondly, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, personal holiness and maturation. That's another front. Oh, brothers and sisters, are you growing? Is God's word transforming you? Is your mind being washed and transformed by the renewing of his word? As a family, are you reading the word of God as a family, family uh, devotions, and allowing the word of God to, to transform the way your children think? The last one is, and we are taking every thought, uh, I'm sorry, and we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is uh, complete. Third area, biblical fellowship. Paul says, man, three things. We're going to engage cultures, personal holiness, and we're going to engage each other and make sure that each other is serving God, submitting to his word, loving him. Brothers and sisters, that's the call of aliens and strangers in this world. Until Jesus Christ comes back, be sobered. The God, God's kingdom is going to suffer violence. And you and I have been placed on this earth to stand in the gap and serve God as a good soldier who does not need to be ashamed. Trust in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Daniel 8. What an incredible encouragement it was, no doubt, to his generation, but one that certainly is to ours. What a needed word of encouragement and sobriety. That, Lord, it is so easy for us in this wealthy land in which we live to begin adopting the message of that is heard so well today. That is, God is is all about our happiness. and, And God can't stand to live in a world where we are not smiling. Father God, what a joy it is to read your word and to read truth. And see, O Lord, that that you have called us and equipped us to battle. And Lord, give us therefore the grace not to grow weary, not to wear out, but to trust you. Lord, if we've been faithful for 40 years, give us grace to be faithful for 40 more. If we've been faithful for one minute, give us grace to be faithful for one more. Lord, I pray you'd give us all that grace. God, give us the families of this body wisdom and vision to see the future for what it is and to equip their children, our children, to be servants and soldiers in this world, to stand when the world is falling and to be willing to be persecuted, willing to be a fool, as Paul was, for Christ. God, give us the grace to not define your character by what we experience. And therefore, Lord, for those of us who are aging and struggling with declining health and and difficult days and things that don't go our way, loss of jobs, Give us the grace, O Lord, not to deduce from these things that you are not on the throat or that you are not good. Give us the grace, O Lord, to prepare our hearts right now to cling to you in the day of difficulty, to love you and serve you, to say with Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. God, may that be our, our, our theme, our passion for your glory. God, give us the grace to therefore be equipped steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let's